I just wanted to um, extend my greetings to those of you. Good afternoon. Um, the purpose of this presentation, I think, is a little bit uh, to describe what's been going on uh, by the CKC or within the CKC, uh, specifically for PACOM, uh, some of the geospatial analysts there, but and not formally attached to the Megacities RSI, but in support of that. Um, the idea here is to present uh, what has been happening and why I think it's relevant. And to do that, um, and being an, a somewhat of an academic myself, I had to include a little bit of a uh, small, slight, uh, painless, hopefully, geography lesson at the end of this to uh, drive home the, 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 the last point toward relevance. But uh, anyway, um, let's see. Okay. I'm just going to focus on the why, the what, and the so what, and uh, hopefully that'll be that won't that won't uh, take me off into too many tangents. Um, it's it's appropriate to remember that the context for all of this is uh, is the assessing megacities, uh, the megacities reconnaissance surveillance intelligence. Uh, that's the project that's going on. I, that's when I say it's a PACOM initiative. Well, it is, but I think they're more involved in that. And again, I'm not formally associated with this, but I have been attentive to it and uh, will continue to be. The two pagers that I'm talking about are essentially a, a, sl a series of um, literature reviews uh, to establish a baseline. Um, the relevance of these in the beginning has been conceptualization. I was asked to do this in the first place so that uh, we could sort of, uh, PACOM could get their heads around where they wanted to go with this and establish parameters, establish boundaries, and establish a, a baseline of what's been done, and uh, they can move forward on that. Now, those of you familiar, and many of you on this are familiar with the uh, the Megacities RSI project, will will know that there are several models that are in the process of being developed if they're not already developed and uh, that the two pager relevance to those are in conceptualizing what those might be and where they might go and uh, what the boundaries of, uh, of, of those are. You know, you don't want them to try and make them do too much. You want them to be as specific as possible. So in the initial sense, that's where we're at. We're in conceptualization and these are relevant to that. In the ultimate sense, though, and the reason that this will probably continue to move on is for calibration, because uh, the application of those models will require a tremendous amount of calibration to avoid some of the pitfalls of using models. So um, knowing what lenses to look through are really important. And that's been one of the primary um, outcomes of the two pagers is uh, being able to identify different lenses, analytical lenses, that may be important in trying to understand what you're seeing when you're trying to see uh, what's going on in the megacities themselves, culture, in terms of cultural formation. Um, these are some of the models that uh, MRSI proposes. I pulled this from uh, just one of the five by eights that came out. And if this is outdated, I'm, I apologize. It's not my intent to. Uh, describe the project only to show that uh, what's going to be some of the products of this project or at least proposed products of this project are a series of models that will be employed to uh, advance cross-cultural co comprehension as especially in megacities which has been noted as being um, one of the uh, primary cultural formation cultural formation um, venues, and for good reason. So that's that's not intended to be a full introduction to what MRSI is, just uh, just put you in the proper frame of mind contextually of what we're talking about here. When we get into the what, essentially what's happened so far, there's been uh, four megacities reviews. Uh, two pagers, I call them, because uh, we try and I try and select from a wide range of research those which have uh, fairly uh, th they're more meaningful, they are um, better prepared. Giving you here is the 
primary works that are featured in each one of those. Um, these have been published on the CKC blog. They were also disseminated through a, a distribution list that I have that many of you are on. Um, the reason I like the, the way the themes have broken out is that they take me toward a more holistic geospatial approach, which I tend to prefer because you know I'm an economic geographer and that's the way I think. But um, they also have some concepts that break us out of the uh, of the notion that mega cities are full of slums and in slums are, are the slums are full of uh, dependent people on a, a colonial government. I mean, it's colonial way of thinking, and it's uh, as been shown in this first megacities by uh, Ananya Roy uh, in her work, Slum Dog Cities. She comes up with a lot of really interesting concepts, and she lists them under this all-encompassing term subaltern urbanism, which uh, when you try and break it down uh, morphologically is kind of difficult. Uh, essentially what she's doing, along with George Packer, who also wrote an article in Lagos in this same uh, megacities uh, work, or this same two-pager, they're just dispelling the myth that uh, megacity slums socially organize themselves through, or just, or even primarily, just fear and colonial dependencies. Now, there's still a certain amount of fear that goes along as a, as a mobilizing and form, formational force in megacities, but there's so much more going on than what we tend to think of those. She uses terms like, I point you to the orange terms, the economies of entrepreneurialism, uh, culture of make-do, uh, slum habitus. There, there's, there's a great deal of opportunism, and there's a great deal of entrepreneurial activity that are working to contribute to what is now what... Um, Megacities 2 will point out is the modern cultural transformation, and that's really what we're contending with here, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But the first Megacities features this subaltern approach, and I think Ananya Roy, um, she uh, chaired several sessions at the, at the latest annual uh, AAG meeting, that's the Association of American Geographers, huge meeting, and uh, she chaired several sessions, and urban Geography is a really a growing field within geography, as evidenced by the number of papers, literally hundreds of papers, on urban geography in the, in the latest AAG meeting. Um, the second one, though, wasn't quite so much because it featured um, an analytical approach, as the first one did, that I think is useful. And in each of these, there's more work in there. Each one, of them, each of them. Uh, highlights about 10 to 15 studies that are, I think, worth reading. Um, but the important ones are the ones I'm going to try and hit here. There are more in each of these than just what I'm showing you. The second one featured this study on DACA social formation. You can see the citation right below there by Kamal Siddiqui. Uh, this is the the only study I've seen that's a, of its kind that it has de is developed off of survey information over a 30-year period and draws, uh, it presents, it's book length, it presents uh, a, literally tens or hundreds, maybe even hundreds of uh, analytical graphic organizers uh, and uh, draws obser you know, observations and draws conclusions on those observations. It's, it's worth a look. Uh, the, the second thing um, is that it, uh, pr that it pertains to DACA, which is the target city of the MRSI project. It also confirms a little bit about what uh, Packer and Roy are talking about from the Megacities 1. The two of the observations that I've included in here you can see at the bottom. There are basically several parallel cultures, they call them, operating in DACA with some few interactions between them. No serious, but no serious identification with DACA City detected. Now, it may be interesting to you or not, but what we have here is a, in, the cultural transfer, in the cultural transformation of Megacities, as you'll see later on in the slide, are uh, some mixing and some resistance to mixing. And so uh, both of those are going on at the same time. And you can see that from the observations in this study. Yeah, I think it's an important study to try and access. And uh, you can uh, 
access it, uh, I think, from the web portal, but it's a little tricky because it doesn't load down from the EBSCO uh, because it's so big. So I think, uh, I think I accessed it through um, um, a library association that I have that uh, allowed me to download some of the chapters. Um, and the second quote is, the informal sector provided most of the employment opportunities, which again, it, it attests to the high degree of entrepreneurialism and the diminishing degree of social dependence in, uh, in many of these zones. Speaking of zones, we get then into Mega Cities 3, and uh, the conceptual framework here is contested landscapes. Um, also, uh, a little easier to understand cultures are forming, actively forming. Um, they're not necessarily, as I point out, they're zones of uh, cultural contention uh, right here. But what they are are different urban frontiers around a, a variety of issues. Uh, the same issues uh, said that are spiritually confrontational uh, in one place are not a, a point of contention in another place. So um, rather than being distinct zones of cultural contention, I made that up, then they are essentially places where um, cultures are interacting um, around specific issues, squatting issues, merchandising issues, so on. Um, the thing about a lot of these, these came from a, a special issue on urban studies, and so there are some 15 articles included in this, and they all um, address a particular city in Asia, so within the PACON AO, and uh, they all are not necessarily mega cities, but they're big cities. Mega cities, I think, are are uh, defined as anything over 10 million. Well, anything over uh, 1 million, you're finding the uh, the same kind of cultural formation activity that's just not as intense and it's probably not as accelerated as in the mega cities. Um, Mega Cities 4. Now this has taken us on. I decided to include this because this comes from the uh, geospatial left is where I see it, uh, where I saw it uh, uh, expressed as uh, graphically as it was. It's urban political ecology and uh, this was mostly extracted from the, uh, the, the, uh, an the journal Antipode, uh, which is a kind of a controversial journal, but uh, you know it's worth looking at anyway because this starts talking about and including the items of the environment as formational variables in uh, in a megacity culture. Um, some of the uh, the words that they're, they're the phrases that they're using that describe what's going on here. Our first nature is transfigured into second nature. Um, so they're taking culture and expanding it physical to include the physical elements that make it nature, um, which is a useful concept. I mean, a UP analyst, and I'll point you to this part in the middle here, a UP analyst will attempt to discover and examine water, material, energy and nutrient flows, stocks, value chains, throughput destinations and channels, waste streams, all as substantial explainers of observable cultural relations. Um, that makes it, from a geographical standpoint, a geographic academic standpoint, a really useful approach to understanding what cultures are encountering. And uh, to really explain that, that's where I need to go in to this a little geography lesson that I decided to provide. Um, this has some meaning to the RSI approach. So those of you who understand the RSI, RSI methodology, it was first introduced to me uh, from some SOCOM analysts who developed it for General Flynn in an article he wrote for uh, PRISM. And uh, the, the primary components of the RSI methodology are uh, an examination of ontologies, logics of appropriateness, narratives, and identities. 
I would I would recommend that um, another section be added to that to include place interactions to ensure the focus on people in place rather than just people. Uh, let me explain that a little more here. Why I think that anyway. The so what? Why do we do all this mega cities uh, two pager activity? Well, to help conceptualize, but now also to calibrate because. It's clear what we're trying to understand is a modern cultural transformation, and man, that is happening in cities, especially megacities. These are highly complex, they're fluid, they're deep-seated, and they're potential, potentially volatile regions. Um, what the urban cultural research does is reveal a baseline, a, a, a way to start. How has this been looked at? How has it changed recently and how it's been looked at? What concepts and theoretical frameworks are useful in establishing not only the parameters of the models that we're going to employ, but uh, the the uh, potential outcomes or the range of outcomes, the uh, uh, the baselines of you know where we're going to start, how are we going to predict? As all of these need to be for the models to be useful, need to be included, and they all exist within the research somewhere before we launch off and build a new research or contribute to the, the, the literature is always a living um, entity and so we contribute to it and it grows. So the idea is to understand the modern cultural transformation. Well, here's culture from the perspective of, of an economic and I throw ecologic in there because I kind of like to think of myself that way. In geography, there's a tremendous uh, divide between physical geographers and human geographers and each of them try and uh, separate themselves and wrongly I think I see economic geography as trying to tie those two together because an economic geographer uh, thinks of culture differently culture to me is what people do to satisfy needs and it's that simple it's the expression of what is done what do they actually do to satisfy what needs they have and it's an equal function sure who they are is going to matter they all have different dispositions attitude inclinations talents etc that's going to matter but where they are matters just as much if they're in a humid environment versus an arid environment a hot environment versus a cold environment and so on and especially an urban versus a rural environment Cultural formation in place over time establishes a tradition, and the longer that they're in those places, interacting with those places, the more fiercely attached to that tradition it becomes and the more intricate it becomes. That's going to matter as they tend to move. Let me explain a little bit. Needs are considered Identical, constant, unchanging, everywhere, every time. All humans have the same needs. I list them like this. I pulled this from Paul Eakins back in, the, who's a, wrote a, a, a book called The Living Economy back in the 1970s. Uh, he characterizes them, the needs as permanence, protection, affection, understanding, participation, leisure, creativity, identity, freedom. I've never been able to add to that list. Perhaps you can. The needs are the same. It's the satisfiers of those needs that change. The satisfiers of those needs are the housing and the food and the water and the uh, water, you know, water's water, but shelter, education, associations, all of these things that we use to satisfy those needs are highly variable from place to place, depending upon where you are you will encounter different kinds of satisfiers that you will have at your disposal to meet your needs. Thus, the things that you do to employ those will be different. And that, in part, just by virtue of where you are, makes you a different culture from someone else in a different environment. These change constantly in place over time and from place to place. People affect and are affected by that place and that sit and their situation situation is different from place in that places in one place sorry 
for that circular definition, but situation is how that place interacts with other places. That will affect how that place is used and how those, those cultures form as well. Uh, without getting too involved in that, let's move on. Now, because the satisfiers change over time, the cultures will change over time, and the traditions will evolve. They'll evolve either in place, because people use that place, it will deteriorate, They'll affect it, they'll sculpt it, they'll destroy it, they'll enhance it. Um, weather patterns will change over time and so on. So it'll have some natural alteration which will make that culture change and evolve. That place will interact with other places, mobility. And here's where we're getting into why it's important for megacities. Interaction with others from other places. You adapt and you adopt that equals a transformation. Mobility has been going on forever, but it's accelerating. In the last few decades, it's really accelerating. And it's accelerating in one direction primarily, from the rural to the urban. These are inherently different environments, physical environments. And that's going to matter. The modern cultural transformation under the forces of urbanization, from rural to urban mobility, is accelerating. So we have here, what we're trying to understand is the clash of three traditions, basically, in close proximity. And it's in, it makes it inherently unstable. It makes it quickly changing. It makes it difficult to understand. It makes it difficult to predict. And so, we have to understand that as we employ the models. What you have here are three traditions in place. You have the tradi what I call the tradition in tow. Uh, that's usually rural, but not always. I mean, people do move from city to city, but the tradition in tow is what you bring with you as you move. It's where you grew up. It's, where, it's what is deep-seated within you. Uh, a lot of places have um, different codes that are really important in governing their behavior. Uh, two of those codes, the two that I'm familiar with, that uh, we also, most of us are familiar with, are the Pashtun Wali. Uh, there's also a, a code like that, uh, codes of vendetta, and uh, that, that uh, basically uh, direct your activities in, in certain situations. And so a lot of these codes are much more important than uh, the religious uh, directives that you tend to follow because they're older. That's the tradition in tow. You bring that with you. Then you have the tradition in place. In the mega cities, these are phys actual physical environments and they're not the same as a, a rural environment. You have a lot more pavement. You have uh, water systems that you have to deal with. You have electrical systems, you have political systems that are not the same. They don't operate the same as a rural environment. So you have the tradition in place. And then you have the tradition in flux. And that's changing outcomes uh, that are always going on from the clash between the rural and the urban. The tradition in the toe plus the tradition in place equals the tradition in flux, if you want. Outsider, like us. The importance of this is calibration. Um, and this is where the MRSI project intends to end up. The models that are developing are supposed to be useful for somebody who is trying to understand for the purposes, uh, presumably, of intervention in some way or another, if that tends to be an option. Um, a model should be able to lead you It would be or what to expect if you do anything in that particular area to make a change. So the theoretical frameworks within the two pagers are meant in the end to improve calibration because they all offer a different analytical lens. An outsider is trying to view culture in these places uh, without the benefit of having 
been immersed in it. And even if you're immersed in it for years, you didn't grow up in it. You didn't, you weren't formed by it. And that, that makes all the difference. It's hard to understand all the intricacies of a uh, culture or a tradition that subtly change under the very smallest of circumstances. And there's levels and levels and levels of uh, and degrees of response, required response, uh, alternate, optional response, so things like that, that, that are just almost impossible to fully gauge. But the calibration is necessary because it improves the model performance and it reduces that surprise factor that when you expect something to happen from a particular stimulus and all of a sudden the direction of that response changes and you're not prepared for that. So that's what you're trying to do in uh, using the models appropriately. Calibrate them so that you aren't particularly surprised when something changes. So I'm going to stop there uh, with, a, with one caution. And this is really hard for us to do as researchers and strategists and so on. But it's clear to me, anyway, that the set of cultural things not known to an outsider is always geometrically bigger than the set of things known. Analytical wisdom in that instance demands prudence. And it's, it's hard to learn how to do this, but we need to learn how to be comfortable operating in ignorance, adapt and adopt ourselves. And with that, I'll open it to questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Jim. That was uh, very interesting. And for and while our guests are entering their questions in the chat box down at the bottom of their screen, and I encourage everybody to do so, uh, just uh, just a couple questions. And granted that this is not my area of expertise, so forgive me if I'm if I'm you know pointing out something very obvious. Uh, you talk about place interactions. Uh, that that seems to imply, at least to me, that there's a, a, a threshold or a level of interactive mass that triggers this cultural formation or change. Uh, is that the case, or is it uh, more of the effect of that population on the geography, you know, the adding infrastructure and, and uh, building it up that triggers this cultural change? Am I reading that a little odd? No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, it matters. I mean, the difference, the size, the scale of activity matters. And in megacities, uh, what happens is that it's, it, it accelerates even more. Now, in a rural area, cultures always change, but it's uh, fairly easy to get your head around it. They change at a pace that is uh, more noticeable. Um, in a megacity, it intensifies this, and the proximity of things, uh, the number of people, uh, the flow in from the mobility uh, from uh, from the mobility factor from outside, the urbanization uh, acceleration, intensifies this change. So I'm not trying to dismiss. The scale. I'm just trying to say that it happens relatively soon in an urban area. You can get to a, even a small city of a few hundred thousand or a million. Uh, you're going to find it. In the uh, the cultural transformation speeds up beyond comprehension almost immediately. And then you get into mega cities, and that just that makes it more that complicates the issue and makes it more complex. And so it it, it doesn't. It's not like a threshold for when this kicks in. It's always happening. It's just that the acceleration or the pace of change for, to an outsider observer, I mean, you can only really pick up so much. And uh, it quickly overwhelms our ability to do that once you get Talk about uh, the observation and operating comfortably in the unknown. Do do megacities have uh, a significant number of, of factors that that would confound us as opposed to a, a normal size city or a smaller city? Uh, is the set of of unknowns uh, significantly different from in a megacity versus an average size city? 
Um, no, I don't think the set of unknowns is, is uh, necessarily different. I mean, you still, you're mostly contending with and the, uh, the acceleration of all that uh, is, is harder to see. And in a megacity now, the environment grows as well. So a lot of this is it's going to be harder to see things. You have to focus closer so that you, you're, well, you're ana analytically speaking, your peripheral vision is a bit stunted as well because you have to intensely focus on smaller parts of this. So it's easier to miss, uh, as you get into a mega, mega city, um, things that would uh, alter your vision as well or alter your viewpoint as well. So. The megacity just compounds everything, and that's, it's not that it changes political issues, power structures, um, ethnic variation, levels of resistance to change, those sorts of things, regardless of the kind of urban environment you're in. But in a megacity, it becomes so much more demanding because uh, your focus has to increase to improve the depth of your observation, which uh, then um, comes at the expense of, your, of the breadth of your observation. And so you need more observation in a megacity. You need more people looking um, than you would in a smaller area. One one person in a rural area can cover quite a quite a space and get some sense of the tradition that's evolving. But you put that one person in a in a mega city and it it shrinks way down to maybe a block um, or two or or just a very small space. And now you have more people spread out, so you you kind of uh, you lose that perspective uh, just by virtue of the limitations of your own tool your head, your eyes, your, your own senses. Okay, I, I was thinking about the, the rate of growth and adaptation. Uh, does, did you see that there was anything that talked about rate of growth? And I'm, I'm specifically thinking about uh, some of the, the really big cities in the east versus the ones that, that have grown up very rapidly uh, versus some in the west that have grown up over a century or two. Uh, so does the, the, the rate of growth and adaptation, uh, d is that mitigate some of this, this change triggering? Absolutely. Um, the rate of growth has been a geographic concern since uh, the 50s. Mark Jefferson started this off in the 50s and uh, with the, the rank size correlation and he was trying to point out that uh, fast growth requires uh, a very intense mixture. I mean, slow growth over time, if you have a city that's been in place uh, for as many of these cities that we're talking about have for literally millennia, then uh, you will have an urban culture in place that's been there for a long time and it has grown up in that particular physical environment and that physical environment has affected it for a long time. So as it uh, as absorbs people from the country, though, that becomes under stress. And as that pace accelerates, it comes under more stress. And so now there are more uncertainties uh, because of the uh, resistance to uh, adoption and adaption. Um, those things, when they happen over time, gradually are more noticeable and um, more predictable. With the scale of cities and the rapid growth of cities, all, all bets are off because uh, you, you miss things. You, you, it's harder to, to notice those things. It's harder to understand um, the intensities increased ge geometrically by factors of uh, 10 or 100 in some cases. And so uh, that's why uh, the megacities are becoming uh, more the focus of our attention because, well, there's in a way, we miss more. It's, it's a place to hide in plain sight, as it were. And uh, just because of the scale of activity in a small space, it's, it's still um, 
difficult to understand how all of that intensity contributes to the to the level and the uh, pace of uh, that cultural formation and, and then how to understand it and predict it and that's that's in the end that's really what's important okay getting back to the uh, the two pagers uh, what was your what was your selection criteria for the articles that you, you featured in your two pager article in your two pagers well, mostly if they uh, contribute to a, an innovation, uh, I think an analytical in innovation, a way of thinking that uh, that I thought was uh, unusual and useful and relevant, uh, something that maybe provided a counterpoint to the way things have been done uh, and was well-written and well-researched. Um, and it seemed to resonate uh, with me. So those are usually the ones that I kept. And uh, as a theme, as a theme developed, then I tried to stay common to that theme, but without, I didn't want to exclude anything that was, that I found that, said, that I thought was useful, even though if it didn't pertain to that theme. But those are the primary criteria. If it was innovative, uh, if it was higher quality research, uh, and if it was, uh, I think, provide uh, some sort of a new way to, uh, to affect the analytical approach that we're seeking. Great. Well, I appreciate all the questions and uh, the very insightful uh, thoughts coming out in the two pagers. Uh, I, I think this is a lot bigger than just a number of two pagers, and I, I certainly invite all of our audience to uh, become part of this uh, discussion, both on the CKC website and as part of the Megacities initiative. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, thought and I think it has the potential to change some things. So, uh, Dr. Nawal, do you have some, uh, uh, what is the big thought that you'd like folks to take away from this? I think the big thought that I need, that I have is that uh, place matters and that's, that's always the big thought for a geographer. Place matters. Uh, an urban environment is a different kind of place. It offers uh, different kinds of uh, potential satisfiers for needs. They're acquired differently. Um, situation matters so much more because it's so much more interactive. If you're in a small neighborhood, you're being forced to interact with people who are different from you. And that's not always the case in a rural area. Some are situated for that. Some are more isolated. Isolation is gone in a uh, mega city for the most part. You're forced to interact with others and that is what makes it so uncertain. Um, that's what also makes it so important to stay flexible in your analytical approach and to understand that even though you think you know something and you may actually know something, I mean the idea is to understand cultures and how they uh, react with a certain degree of uh, constancy, but understanding that even if you know something it's probably more the case that you are ignorant of what's going on as well at the same time. Um, in terms of uh, continuing activity as well uh, the, attempt is, the attempt is being made to get a lot of the, a lot of the authors featured in these mega cities two pagers to come on and uh, give their perspective and explain their approaches a little bit more in a direct fashion. Um, so keep looking for that as well. Great. Before we, uh, before I let you go, uh, we do have a question that came in. I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, with the size of the megacities and the acceleration of change that you mentioned, can the models being developed uh, establish a true, a true baseline so future trends, trends can be ascertained or will the models be unable to establish this baseline and locate trends? No, I think the models can establish a baseline as long as they are open to a higher degree of flexibility in what that will be. Um, everything adds to what the baseline is. Um, and as long as the models are flexible enough, if they, if they get rigid and they uh, take a small known and uh, build that into um, 
or put that through a set of uh, relational probabilities uh, to generate an outcome, then uh, yeah, you can do that as long as you. I think when you see that outcome, you need to understand that that's only that the probability of that outcome is probably lower than you might think it is, and even if the model pushes it out there as, just be ready to um, be wrong in a lot of cases. And uh, as long as a model can do that, and I think you can, I think you can develop a, a model that will allow for a, a great deal of flexibility, then it'll be a useful model. But if, it, if it's a model that uh, closes itself off or considers itself more precise or accurate than it actually is, I think it's a model that's not uh, truthfully assessing itself based on the full set of uh, possible relations. But modeling is useful. I'm not, I'm not trying to be anti-model. I think models are great, but they need to stay flexible in this case. In terms of cultural formation in megacities, the variable and the pace of change, the variables involved and the pace of change are just an overwhelming set of uh, of a phenomenon to try and absorb.